thing of a stir by inviting 27 different people from 27 different EU countries into the studio to find out what they thought about Brexit. Well, quite a sight. Could barely fit into the studio, therefore I'm delighted to say that they've got me now doing the same thing again. Well, they're lined up outside the studio, so let's meet them all first. Hello. Where are you from? Romania. And what do you do here? Uh, I'm a cloud applications analyst. Very good to see you. Hello. Hello How do you do? Wh where are you from? Slovenia. And what do you do here? I'm retired. Nice to see you. Hello. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, I'm Patricia from... Connell. I'm from France and I run a website called France in London. Very good indeed. Thank you. Sue. Hello. How do you do? Where are you from? Uh, I'm Dina from Portugal and I run free businesses called A Portuguese Love. Very America. good to see you. Come on in. Hello, how do you do? Uh, Where are you Cyprus, from? Cyprus. Cyprus. And we met before at and, their office. And what do you do? I'm an accountant. Very good to see you. Hello. Uh, yeah. Where are you from? Greece. And what do you do? I'm a journalist. A fellow journalist. Thank you. Hello, how do you do? And uh, where are you from? Italy. And what do you do? I work in the social media business marketing. Excellent. Hello, how do you do? Hi. Where are you from? I'm from Lithuania. And what do you do? I um, have my architectural practice here. Very good to see you. Nice to come on in. Hi. Hello, how do you do? Where are you from and what do you do? I'm from the Netherlands and I'm a life coach at the Maze Yourself Coaching. Very good indeed. Hello, how do you do? Hello. Where are you from and what do you do? Uh, hi, I'm uh, Johanna from Finland and uh, we are actually celebrating our 100th uh, centenary of our independence. Fantastic. Thank you. Nice to see you. Come on in. Hello, how do you do? Where are you from and what do you do? I am from Luxembourg and I'm teaching at the London School of Economics and I'm running the Systemic Risk Centre there. Very good. Find some room over there. Hello, how do you do? And where are you from and what do you do? Hello, I am from Estonia and I am an accountant. Thank you very much indeed. Hello, how do you do and uh, where are you from and what do you do? Hi, I am from Latvia. I'm working as assistant manager in Latvian guest house in central London. Very good. Nice to see you. Come on in. Hello, how do you do? Where are you from and what do you do? Fine, thank you. I'm from Poland. My name is Janusz Baginski and I work for a Polish uh, language school uh, across the streets, uh, Paul Words, uh, run by an entrepreneur, Ms. Nowoselska. Very good to see you. Nice to see you. Hello, how do you do? Hello. Where are you from? What do you do? Nice to meet you. My name is Tomasz. I work for uh, a number of independent... What country are you from? Uh, I'm from Hungary. I work for independent politicians and I'm advising on uh, political and economic issues. Excellent. Come on in. Hello. How do you do? Where are you from and what do you do? Hi, my name is Stanislav. I'm from Bulgaria uh, and I'm doing a PhD in physics at the University of Southampton. Very good. Come on in. Find some room. Hello. How do you do? Where are you from and what do you do? Yes, I'm Katya. I'm from Croatia and I'm a nursing student. Very good. Nice to see you. Hello. How do you do? Now, where are you from and what do you I'm do? I'm from Brussels, Belgium and uh, I'm a former lawyer who is a cultural entrepreneur. Excellent. Come on in if we can squeeze you up a bit over there. Hello, how do you do? Where are you from? And I'm from Slovakia. And what do you do? And I run a translation agency. Very good. Nice to see you. Come on in. Hello, how do you do now? Where are you from and what do you do? I'm from Czech Republic and I'm intern at the Czech Centre London. Very good. Nice to see you. Come on in if you can find some room over there. Hello, how do you do? Again, where are you from and what do you do? Hi, I'm from Austria and I'm a classical musician. Excellent. Come on in. Come on in. Hello, how do you do? Hi. Now, where are you from? I'm from Spain. I'm just graduated. Excellent. Nice to see you. Come on in. Hello, how do you do? I'm good. I'm Swedish and I'm a deputy principal. Very good. Nice to see you. Hello. How do you do? Good afternoon. Very well. Thank you. Where are you from? Um, I'm from Malta. Robert Carbonaro. I've uh, been living in London for five years. So I'm a Londoner. What do you do? From what Malta. do you do? I'm a contemporary musician. So I'm at Hangar. Very good. Join the other musicians over there. Hello. How do you do? Where are you from? I'm from Germany. I work for the German YMCA in London. Uh, oh, very good. Excellent. Nice to see you. Hello. How do you do? Brilliant. Now, where are you from? Um, Ireland. Uh, Michael Kingston. I work. And Michael, what do you do? Um, I'm working on regulatory reviews into the Grenfell fire tragedy and oh, very the migrant crisis in the Mediterranean. Oh, fascinating. Okay, come on in. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming. Right, okay. Um, well, <laughs> we're, going to, uh, we're going to get the uh, former leader of UKIP, Michael Farage, M Nigel Farage, I beg your pardon, here. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, here, how many of you actually know uh, Nigel Farage? Can you just stick your hands in the air? Do you know of him? Okay. Know him? No, uh, you... <laughs> yeah, you all know of him. Okay, hands down. And how many of you agree with Nigel Farage in, let's say, anything that he says? I'll give it a wide interpretation. No? Anyone? No hand? Not a single hand up. Oh, one hand at the back. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I've got to take these headphones off. Sorry, say that again. He's got a good choice in his wife's. Oh, he's got a good choice in his wife. Okay, very funny. He's got a good choice in his wife. How many of you actually then think uh, that Brexit will happen? Just hands up. How many of you think it's going to happen? 
OK, pretty much everybody, mostly, except for a couple. No, I know, but I said pretty much everybody, but not, not everybody. And how many of you think that Brexit won't happen? Don't know. Don't know. OK, so no... Oh, yes, one hand over there. That's from France, I think, is it not? Yes, it is, indeed. So one, maybe two hands going up. So now we're going to bring... No, not here yet. OK. So anyway, the quick question is here, how many... How, Thanks, I've got some headphones on. For those of you who are listening, this is a bit complicated here because we've got so many people in the studio. But I'm going to try my best on this. Water's gone everywhere. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> At last, the man himself. So, Nigel, it's a bit like being in the Dan uh, Daniel in the Lion's Den, I think, isn't it? Are it, you ready to get started? You know, it feels a bit like being in the European Parliament, because often hundreds of them don't like me there, so we'll see how we get on. Right, well, okay, they didn't say they didn't like you. <laughs> well, we'll see. I heard a couple of boos. <laughs> so, anyway, right, Nigel, let's, uh, let's see what questions we've got here for you. So, who wants to ask Nigel a particular question? OK, can I just have you stepping forward here? OK, it's a lady from Finland. Go on. Hello, uh, I'm from Finland. I work for the Finnish Institute in London. And I would like to ask you, what do you think of the future generations in the UK and Europe? Quite many young people were actually quite keen to stay in the European Union. And uh, they have been happy for having these chances to study abroad and uh, in many European countries. So uh, how, what do you say to them? Well, we don't, need, disappointed we don't need generations? to be run by a bunch of unelected old men in Brussels in order to have student exchanges. We can do that without political union. And we will go on doing that once we've left the European Union. What is really interesting, though, is this, that you're quite right. Two-thirds of the young people in this country voted Remain, and yet, across the rest of Europe, it's the under-40s that are voting for the new Eurosceptic parties of right and left. So, actually, if you look at Marine Le Pen's vote, for example, where she dominates is with young voters. So it's, it's one area in which... It, it, OK, it, right. No, I'm going to get another question. I'm going to get another question. A gentleman here from Malta. Uh, obviously, those unelected... Um people include yourself because as you know uh, you're a former uh, member of the Mem European Parliament. I still am. Um, yeah, of course. Um, although it's just the presidency. What's your question? What's your question? Basically the question is um, what about people who have partners um, say, if, say I've got an, a, a British um, partner you know that will directly affect families, partners and children and we get the impression that we might be used as bargaining chips. What do you say to that? Obviously, you, um, you um, had, um, you know, a, a, an EU national um, as, as, a, as a spouse partner. Yeah, yeah. And uh, obviously, okay. it's a very touching Let's subject. get him to answer that question. Well, do you know something? Um, I, I was all in favour of the government making a big, generous offer on this. And, and Monday of this week, that's exactly what they've done. You know, they've been very generous about this, that anyone that's here and has obeyed the law and paid their taxes are going to have full rights in this country. I think, I think the UK government's taken the right position on this. But ultimately, you know, and just think about this. The population of this country is rising by half a million people every year. We cannot go on with open borders forever. OK, Nigel, right, we've got somebody here from Hungary. What's your question? Um, hey there. Um, I wanted to ask you about some of your grudges with the EU. Do you actually think that they were irreparable in the short term and no reforms could have come through, for example, through the most recently published White Book? Well, of course, your Prime Minister in Hungary, of course, makes me look um, a very moderate Eurosceptic because he's been comparing the EU to the former Soviet Union recently. Look, the argument for years was, let's reform the European Union. They had a chance to do that when they had the EU constitution ten years ago. They didn't take that opportunity. You're living in a system where the unelected commission has the sole ability to make law. That is not democracy. Right, Nigel, we've got someone here from Poland who wants to ask you a question. Uh, what do you think about the government's uh, uh, decision to uh, get all European citizens to apply for an, an ID? Uh, there are hundreds of uh, thousands of EU citizens who have already applied for permanent residence and they had to go through a very lengthy process of uh, doing paperwork and so on and so forth and the criteria had to be very well, strict criteria had okay. to be met and now they are on par with all others. All right. Nigel, over to you. you, you know something? There, was a, there was a big report last week from a guy who had a big job at the Home Office and, and stood down two years ago. He estimates that illegal immigration, illegal, is running at a quarter of a million people every year into this country. It's back to the previous question. We have to get a grip on this, and if people have to fill in a few forms, so be it. OK, we've got the Republic of Ireland here. 
Um, I'd just like to ask you, Nigel, you, you came in sort of laughing and, and, and joking, and, but this is a very serious situation we're in, and I'd like to know what you think of the um, political upheaval that this is all, all causing at the moment, and in particular with reference to um, political upheaval taking precedence over civic duty and issues such as recommendations following the Camberwell fire disaster and why government haven't been able to take that seriously and focus oh. on civ civic issues. No, I think I know. I, 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 on, on, on the Europe issue, yeah, I, mean, yeah, obviously I know you're an expert in this area. I but mean, it's very interesting, very interesting uh, to talk to, uh, to have an Irish question because, of course, the Irish people twice voted against European treaties just to be ignored and forced to vote again. So I, I think in terms in terms of political upheaval with Ireland, you know, we are your most important market in the world, particularly for agricultural produce. And do you know something? We want that to continue just as you do. You know, we are not leaving Europe. We haven't just cast you all aside. We're going to go on. We're going to go on trading and being good neighbours. Absolutely. I want to keep this brief. I've got one more question here for you at the moment from Croatia. Yes. So how, what do you think, how would Brexit affect um, Brits that live abroad? Because I think there is 2.2 million Brits Nothing that like live that. in UK, in no. um, uh, Europe. Nothing like that. A maximum is a million, and a lot of those only spend the winter months in the sunshine. Um, but it, how's it going to affect them? Do you know something? The Brits that are on the Costa del Sol, or the Brits that are in France, I mean, they are hugely beneficial to those, to those local economies. Frankly, things aren't... Th well, yes, of uh, okay, course. OK, it's all your questions. But, but Stick your hand on. up in the air and we'll, we'll come You've to you in a second. You can't be heard this. without the microphone. You know, I mean, there may be a million Poles living in the United Kingdom, and there are 40,000 Brits living in Poland. There is an imbalance here. OK, we've got a question from Italy here. Yes, hi there. Listen, uh, you said it's not going to change much with the, with the trade between Italy and the UK. I hope not. But actually, already a 9% decrease has been in the export of olive oil from Italy, which, you know, we're big producers. So what really is the forecast? What do you see between well, the, I, us I mean, and I'm, you? You know, Italy, I'm afraid, is in a very bad, is in a very bad way. Uh, you're stuck inside a currency that is completely unsuited for you. Um, I think Italy would be the first country to leave the Eurozone and, and to get back its own currency. And the sooner it does, for the good of the Italian people, the better. You might want to come back on that one because he's made a prediction about your country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go on, you can have a real go at him. Go on. No, no, I'm saying um, there's some th something that's going on in Italy that keeps saying about that, but I think before Italy leaving the UK, um, European Union, should be looking at the causes that caused UK to leave Europe because I don't think it's a good thing, but I think some issues could be addressed. So maybe Italy could be helped to look at the causes. Well, there is an argument. I mean, there is an argument that actually we might set a trend, that we might look to a Europe in 10 or 15 years' time where as sovereign democratic member states we work and trade and cooperate together rather than giving our power to the bureaucracy in Brussels. That's what we objected to. Right, I just want to, quick, because I've got a couple of people here. Sure. Uh, Nigel made a point here. He said he's been quite disparaging about whether the European Union will survive. How many of you here think that the European Union will survive over the next ten years in the form that it is at the moment? Well, uh, they don't agree with you in that case. Well, they all that's think all right. Well, overwhelmingly <laughs> here. Right, we've got someone from Luxembourg who's got a question for you. Thank you, yes. Uh, there's a tug of war going on between isolationist Brexiteers and globalist Brexiteers. Uh, how can you justify an isolationist Brexit as is being pushed at the moment from both party leaders when probably democratic uh, solution will be to go for a soft Brexit to a globalist Brexit? Do you know something? If I think of all the people, including our host, that took part I'm last completely year... I'm independent. I mean, today you are, of course. <laughs> but if I think of all the people from the centre, left and right, that took part in the Brexit campaign, every single one of them made the argument that freed from the European Union, we can pursue a genuinely global future. Brexit was not isolationist. Brexit was not backward-looking. It was allowing us to be fit for the 21st century. We are not protectionist. We're not backwards. We're looking out to a bigger world. No, no, no. We look, the, the, the European Union is 15% of the world's economy. I'm very interested in our relationship with the other 85 too. OK, I've got someone here from Cyprus first and then the Netherlands. I'll take two questions quickly because I think they'll, you'll be able to get them both in. Nigel, you're talking about unelected persons. And I thought all MEPs are elected uh, apart from commissions who are appointed by governments. But I run Question. a few companies uh, here. I'm an accountant in practice. I run a few companies. Half of my workforce are actually European Union citizens who live here in the past few years. What do I tell them on this question they ask me every day? What is their future? 
Very, very simply, um, it's tragic that we haven't been training our own people to be nurses and engineers and all of those things. Oh, tragic. I mean, you couldn't run an engineering company in Britain without foreign labour. Not possible. There simply aren't enough people qualified in that field. What I would say to people who are coming here to work is come to this country on a work permit, pay your own health insurance, just as you would in any other part of the world. Right, we've got someone from the Netherlands here. You've got a question? Yes, Nigel, I've been here for one and a half years now, so if I read the, the proposal right, it means I will have to go. Is that... Is that... No. no the, honestly, the government produced this document on Monday. Download a copy of it. There's no... Nobody is being told they have to go unless... Unless they're criminals and the government is going to say to foreign criminals, we don't want you, which is perfectly reasonable. So how come you say I don't have to go? But you, because you can work your passage. That's effectively what they've said. The government has said, even if you're here for a short period of time, once you've been here five years, paid your taxes, you will have full rights. We've got they, someone from... I promise you, they've been okay. very, very We've generous. We've got well, some Slovenia here. We've got to get to you a few questions. Um, I've been here for over 30 years, and I do have an identity card, which I was issued in the 80s. So identity cards were for uh, permanent residents. And I also have to say that we were only told about your visit here Right while we were here on this floor, and quite a, quite a few of us don't agree with it. I'm going to tell you why. Do, please. Um, I, I knew the way the, the, uh, the vote was going to go, because I was attacked on a train by some two Essex blokes who told me to go back to my country. And that was like four weeks before the election. Um, I was up all night. I saw the results. I saw you talking on the tally. Um, and the way I felt in the morning is if, if I was dumped by my spouse on social media... I felt really, I felt personally insulted. I felt personally hurt. I felt like I no longer belong to this country after all this time. And I have to tell you that I, um, I didn't want to see a single person who speaks English that day. Fortunately, most people, I was cycling around London, fortunately, it was, a, it was, London was completely empty. And most people I met were either foreigners or Irish, so that was okay. But I still feel, <laughs> but I still feel well, that, that, you know, that way. Big, hang on a second, Nigel. I still feel that way that you know that I'm gradually becoming treated as second-hand, second-tier um, human being. I go to uh, the uh, national hospital, um, NHS hospital, and every single, every single Commonwealth citizen who works there looks at me at us now completely differently. We are being treated differently than well, we were before. Well, that's okay. interesting, because before the referendum, it was the Commonwealth citizens who felt they were getting a rotten deal, because anybody with an EU passport was at the front of the queue, and they effectively were at the back of the queue. And what we're now going to do, as we go into this global future for Britain, we're going to treat people from, from around the world absolutely equally. Don't so you, your uh, rights... Can I just, your, your, your I, I rights are getting Nigel, can I just press you on this one? Yeah. She has made a rather personal point there. Yeah. Is there some sense of sympathy here uh, if, uh, if, if for elements of the campaign on the abuse etc or do you feel uh, there's, like there's been horrendous there's, but there was horrendous abuse during the campaign on both sides and a lot of people oh, and a lot of people oh, and a lot of people a lot of people behave very badly and I don't approve of that at all but all we've done you know we haven't as I said earlier we're not sticking two fingers up to the rest of the world. What we're doing is getting back our democratic rights to be a nation. There are 200 countries in the world that make their own laws and determine their own futures. We've just become a normal country again. OK, we've got a gentleman from Slovakia here. Nigel, right, Nigel, Nigel you, you can't be heard if the microphone's not with you, sir. So. Nigel, if I may ask you, early on you said we can't leave this country with open borders. Yeah. Now, it's one of those half-truths or half-lies which uh, have been put forward by yourselves and people on the Brexit side. It's not true, because the Schengen finishes at Calais. And, and in fact, a number of, uh, half of the immigrants in this country, or new immigrants in this country, are non-EU immigrants. Exactly. So um, this yeah, message was passed on by people like yourselves, Inaccurate. It's the same thing as with the 350 billion million NHS. Sorry, if I've, I'm finishing yeah. now. NHS. Th this half truth ha have affected people who voted for Brexit, who were not quite aware of all the facts. Well, so, Nigel, hang on. Before you do, just one yeah. quick question for yeah. you on the back of this. Do you regret anything that was said during the campaign that may have been misunderstood oh, or misled? I think, or I, 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 think, I think the big Boris thing 
uh, Ian, on the National Health Service, the 350 million, that was a mistake. If they'd said 200 million, it would have been legit. That was a mistake. But, but just, to, just to remind you, sir, a so-called British passport <coughs> has two words at the top of it. They are European Union, and 500 million people have those passports. And yes, we're not in Schengen, you have to show a passport at Dover, but we have total free movement of people. And I would say this, compared to every other country in Europe, we, since 1945, have been the most generous, the most generous to refugees, the most generous and welcoming to immigrants from all over the world. And we did, for 60 years, have a policy where net migration into Britain ran at 30,000 people every year for 60 years. It is now running at 300,000 a year. The point I'm making is we have to get a grip. We've got uh, time for one more question from Romania, and uh, then, as I understand it, uh, you're going to be leaving the studio, but the 27 are remaining. Ah. <laughs> Hi, I'm from Romania, so I hope you're not too scared of being so close. Um, you know, the Brexit vote was based on lies such as the £350 million a week for the NHS, scaremongering and some really dubious funds from the DUP that were spent in the UK. Um, so I'm quite not sure that the vote was actually democratic, but that's another story. My question today is, why is... It's not for you, but it's for Theresa May. Why is Theresa May pretending she's made a fair and generous deal and she's pretending that the EU must resop uh, resop reciprocate, reciprocate yeah. um, when they actually put a deal on the table on the 12th of June that guarantees my, the UK's people's rights in Europe for life? She's offered an extra step in acquiring well, citizenship that will cost and will cause a lot of hassle. I might not have the documentation needed, so well, I but, don't but, know... But this happens... Yeah, I think we got that. But, but this happens anywhere else in the world. I said earlier, Britain's becoming a normal country. You know, that's all we're doing. We're not against anybody, but we're becoming a normal country, and we're also going to be a little bit less European and a bit more global in our outlook for the future. And, and, and you know what? Actually, for us, this is a tremendously liberating and exciting thing for us to have done. We're taking back our ancient democratic rights, and there's a big world out there. And I'm, I'm really excited by it. OK, right, that was the last question to Nigel Farage. I can now just say I think uh, you've all done incredibly well so far.